Dan, yeah. you can really sense it, right? You know, four weeks, uh, 14 days away now, two weeks. I mean, every day it's going to build. You're going to see little shifts in different races that are going to tell us maybe an awful lot in the end. We just show you Republicans have the advantage in the House. We still believe that. We've thought that for many, many months. Democrat best case scenario as of today, 218 is your majority. Dems could get 219 if they win all the toss ups. It is a big challenge and a high hurdle for Republicans. Best case today, we believe, could be as high as 249 seats in the House. We'll see whether or not it goes that way. Let me go forward one time here and show you on the Senate. Uh, this is where we were a month ago. It's where we were a week ago. 47 solid Democratic seats, 49 solid Republican seats. Those four in the middle in yellow are still the critical races. And I'll show you on a bit of a, like a, a what-if map, we call this, okay? So this is the Senate today. You see all the states in yellow. There's four of them, right? You got Nevada here in the West and Arizona, Pennsylvania and Georgia. We got 49 Republican, 47 Democrat. What if Republicans were to run the table in a big wave in 14 days? What if they take all four Senate seats? This is what your margin would be. 5347 based on the analysis as of today. Now, there could be other toss-up seats out there in the Senate, but we believe as of today those four are the most critical. You'd be at 53-47. Mitch McConnell would be a very happy guy. But what if you got issues in Arizona? Blake Masters can't pull that out. Watch how the margins change. What if Raphael Warnock were to beat Herschel Walker even um, Tuesday in 14 days or during a runoff the first week of December? You're now at 51-49. What if Fetterman is stronger than we think in Pennsylvania? You'd be back to where we are right now at 50-50, one of the many, many scenarios that could happen come election night and beyond. Want to bring in Carl Rove. Carl, good morning to you. You just wrote about it. What do you make of the closing argument from President Biden and Democratic candidates to keep this Senate in control? Uh, I'm mystified by it, frankly. Uh, let, let's take a look at what the president has laying out as the, f as the final closing message. First of all, he went and gave a speech last week and said his number one priority in the new Congress is to pass a bill reinstituting Roe v. Wade nationwide. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision last summer, 8 percent of Americans said abortion was the number one issue in Gallup. Today, that's at 4 percent, way down the list. And then he went, went out and talked about his big legislative accomplishments, the American Rescue Plan, blah, 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 most of which the American people don't get, none of the labels which have stuck. And, and a lot of which has drawn derision. The Re Inflation Reduction Act, is nobody believes that it has anything to do with inflation. And then finally, he started last week saying the economy, he said, is strong as hell and has repeated how they've been having an historic recovery. Twenty seven percent of the American people think the country is going in the right direction. More than half the American people think their own personal financial circumstances are worse off than last year. And the issue of inflation is hitting the American people every single day when they go go to the grocery, when they, uh, when they get their bills in the mail, when they go fill up the car, and somehow or another the president thinks that's a strong message to end on, that, that uh, don't worry, we've already got it taken care of, the economy is great. Uh, I'm mystified. Who's the political genius in the White House who dreamed this up? I want to ask you about something he said yesterday and where he said it. Let's first listen to what he said about the end of the election. You know, whether we uh, maintain control of the Senate and the House is a big deal. And uh, so far, we're running against the tide. Republicans ahead, Democrats ahead, Republicans ahead. But it's going to close, I think, with seeing uh, one more shift. Democrats ahead. So that was yesterday, 15 days before the election. And he gave that rousing speech to Democratic staffers at the DNC. Uh, wishful thinking. I mean, we saw this with Nancy Pelosi going on national television saying, you know, we're going to keep the House and by adding seats. Look, since in the last, since, since we've created American political parties between the years of 1818 and 1824, there have been two first midterm elections in which the White House party gained seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, 1934 and 2002. This ain't FDR. This is not George W. Bush in the aftermath of 9-11 with sky-high approval ratings. This is Joe Biden, who's sitting there about 42, 43 percent approval. And on the big issues, the economy, inflation and crime, he's sitting with approval ratings in the third. 30s. 
So he's thinking there's going to be some big turn. But what is that turn? It's certainly not his closing argument. Is he waiting for what? To, to, to look like a hero by you know, saving the, the world from annihilation from a, lo a loose comet? I don't know. But mm -hmm. this is wishful thinking, bucking up his people at the DNC, just like Hillary, uh, just like uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi was bucking up her members by going on Seth Meyers and saying we're going to add seats. Not going to happen. Carl, uh, I got a minute left here. This is where the president will campaign in the closing two weeks. I got Portland, Oregon, Irvine, California, Pittsburgh, PA, Philadelphia, PA, and then Dover, Delaware. I, I believe some of those stops in PA might be with President Obama. Um, make the case on what that tells you. Well, first of all, he's going to places where he is popular, Delaware and Oregon. But if I were John Fetterman, I would, I would not like him to be coming to Pennsylvania because the president's uh, approval in Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, is in the 30s. And so he's going to places where he's reminding people of the need to send him a message. And his message is causing people also to say, I, I, I really want to send him a message because he ain't to, to, to clued into reality. Uh, the, this message of the economy is strong. I've done everything that you needed me to do in order to get the country going in the right direction. And, and abortion is the number one issue. That is not a winning message in a state in which he's underwater as much as he is in Pennsylvania. So I understand Delaware. I understand Oregon. But I don't understand him going to places like, you know, Nevada and uh, Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. Wisconsin and Florida, where, where his numbers aren't good and where Republicans are on the and move. And he's going to Irvine, California. I think that's an interesting one, because isn't that Katie Porter's yeah, Katie, district? Yeah, Katie Porter's district, who is a star of the progressive left uh, and, 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 and uh, took a Republican seat when yep. she first got elected, but is apparently in trouble this yep. time around and could go down. Uh, I, maybe in California it, it helps, but if I were the president, I'd be finding things to do on the international stage or <laughs> as president that made me look like an effective chief executive. I wouldn't be the campaigner in chief. We're going to give you another week, Carl. Then we're going to go predictions, all right? Okay. Thank you, sir. Nice to see yeah. you in Austin. Carl Rove, thanks. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.